started. Welcome everybody to the Revolution. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Nick Roy. Uh, we've known each other now for 18 years already. Uh, 98, uh, actually at the same time, we both joined Sebastian's lab, Sebastian Franz lab at CMU. I just started a postdoc and Nick did his, uh, started his PhD at the same time. Um, Nick has done some of the most exciting work in robot decision making and planning under uncertainty. <coughs> and in the PhD, he's been working on mostly um, setting up a, a navigation system for a nursing home robot. But he also worked, for example, on a POMDP planner that enables the robot to, uh, to have conversations with people and answer questions and stuff like that. And in 2003, he joined Aero Astro Department as faculty at MIT. And he's also at CSAIL. And of course, Aero Astro, so he then moved into um, UAVs, uh, mostly quadcopters and fixed wing vehicles. And in that domain, also uh, planning under uncertainty. He did a two year kind of sabbatical from MIT where he was at Google and he actually started the Project Wing, which is kind of a Google delivery kind of system. And today, he'll give us an overview of his recent work in that area. All right, Nick. Great. Thank you so much, Dieter. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it is a super exciting time, I think, and it has been for a while to be working in drones. Um, as Dieter said, I actually didn't have a, a degree from an aero astro department. I got hired uh, to uh, join MIT largely to work on a lot of the challenges that have been developed in um, uh, uh, address a lot of the challenges in ground vehicles, you know, sensing, perception, mapping, uh, motion planning, etc. And uh, you know, had some successes uh, early on in just you know tackling the problem of GPS night navigation. This video is uh, fr from early on in my group where we uh, took advantage of the growing a number of little laser range finders like the Hakuya laser range finder and showed that we could build uh, maps uh, that looked very much like uh, had been built by a ground vehicle. Um, and then uh, spend a little bit more time working, uh, uh, trying to see if you could put that same technology on uh, fixed wing vehicles like this. And I'll talk a little bit more about getting fixed wing vehicles to fly in GPS denied environments. Um, and then, as Dieter said, I spent some time at Google, where uh, among the other things in terms of developing a delivery system is that we developed uh, hybrid vehicles. This, in particular, is a tail sitter that's capable of VTOL, um, you know, uh, takeoff and landing, but then it's also capable of pitching over and going into the more energy efficient uh, aerodynamic cruise. And so we're seeing. I, and I think everybody recognizes there's just an explosion in terms of drone technologies of various kinds. And uh, there's a lot of different things I could talk about. But what I wanted to talk today about is some of the challenges in, in these specific vehicles, especially the fixed wing vehicle um, and, and others like that. Um, what are, these vehicles are different from ground vehicles because they have complex and fast dynamics. Um, the quad rotor is capable of stopping and uh, looking around at things the way a ground vehicle can when it's not sure what to do. But the air domain tends to punish you for doing that. Um, certainly stopping and hovering is not feasible for a fixed wing vehicle. It's also really energy inefficient for a rotary wing vehicle. Um, I also want to do, uh, I want to take advantage of the speed of air vehicles. Uh, but then how do you do that in unknown environments? Most people uh, think of GPS night navigation for air vehicles as something flying high up with a downward facing camera. But in cluttered, structured indoor environments where you don't have a known map, it's really hard to know what to do. And that's something that I'm super excited about tackling. Um, there are also challenges with you know, just the basic sensing on air vehicles. You know, a lot of us are, who have been grown up in the tradition of Zik laser rangefinders or the Hakuya laser rangefinder got very used to the idea of having like, you know, tremendous field of view and, and really good observation of the environmental structure. And that's just not the case on a fast moving air vehicle uh, where you have either limited field of view camera, uh, possibly limited range depth camera, um, or very narrow slice of the environment in terms of the laser rangefinder. Um, I'm actually not going to talk at all about handling the sensor range and field of view limits today because the talk would be, be far too long. Um, but, but there are interesting questions uh, to be tackled there. And so I'm primarily going to talk about two research directions in my group. One is just how do you plan, how do you do solve the motion planning problem efficiently for a vehicle with complicated dynamics like a fixed wing vehicle? And then I'm going to talk about how you actually deal in the planning uh, sense with sensor limitations in an unknown map. Um, and so this talk primarily is going to be about just the planning side of getting an air vehicle of any description with any kind of dynamics to move quickly through an unknown environment. Um, so let's dig in. Um, let's actually assume that we have 
a known environment, and we want to solve the motion planning problem. I give you a, a, a map of, this is a map of the third floor of this data center at MIT. How do you actually solve the motion planning problem here? Well, it seems that we actually have good tools now for solving this problem. Uh, you know, randomized motion planning that started in 96 with the probabilistic roadmap, and then a year later with the rapidly exploring tree, and, uh, rapidly exploring random tree. And then most recently with Sertash Karaman and Emilio Frizzoli's work, the RT star seems to give us tools that allow us to solve complicated motion planning problems for uh, kinodynamic motion planning problems very efficiently. Um, the problem, these things are very good for uh, simple systems with simple dynamics. But if you have an air vehicle with complicated dynamics, it's actually not so straightforward. They can still do it, without a doubt. But the, uh, if you have, for instance, an air vehicle that has a finite radius of curvature, can't stop and do point turns, um, where you can't necessarily guarantee that there's a straight line path between any two poses, then you have to get into this business of how do you, when you're growing a motion planning tree and trying to figure out how to move through an, uh, an environment, you start try worrying very much about how do you actually get from sample pose to sample pose. So the RT star, for those who don't know, basically uh, samples poses in the environment, checks to see if they're in a collision-free state. And if they are, it joins it to the other samples if there exists a, a, a path between them, and typically assumes a straight line path. And then there's a bunch of rewiring magic in order to ensure that you get the optimal, optimal plan. And like I say, that does work for a lot of these vehicles. But I had this conversation with Sid Srinivasa, whom I think a lot of you know. And he observed, he sent this an email to me, and I, it was so nicely said that I just want to reproduce it, is that if you have a vehicle with complicated differential constraints, then the problem of getting from one sample to another sample, the so-called steer function, is so hard that it's as hard as the original motion planning problem itself. And the way that caches out, or you experience it in reality, is that when you start trying to solve high-dimensional complex dynamic problems with the RT star, it's really slow. And how slow is really slow? Well, I took a really simple uh, 3D problem here. And you can see the results of growing the RRT star. <coughs> and there's like five obstacles, and there's an orange goal on the top. And that took 120 seconds. And, and this is you know, a year old, and we weren't taking advantage of GPUs. And, and no deep learning was involved here. So clearly, this is a suboptimal result. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was slow, uh, 120 uh, seconds. And so that's just not uh, practical. Um, so, one of the things that one of the themes that I'm going to uh, touch on a couple times in this talk is that there, even though you may have an air vehicle uh, with complicated dynamics, finite radius of curvature, can't stop and turn on a dime, there is structure in the dynamics, and taking advantage of that structure is often the way to uh, getting efficient uh, motion plans out. So. One ex the example of the structure that I'm going to take advantage of here is a concept of differential flatness. So differential flatness is the idea that uh, you, your system may live in a uh, complex high dimensional space. But in fact, there's a small number of variables that matter. And if you control that small number of variables, you can actually analytically recover the rest of the state of the system. So, uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, a quadrotor is differentially flat in the sense that if you just plan the center of the body and the <coughs> orientation, uh, the, the heading direction, then uh, the other two uh, dimensions come for essentially for free. You don't need to optimize the motion plan of a quadrotor for all six degrees of freedom that you might have. Um, your car. Uh, is also differentially flat. So you can choose to plan the, the center of the body of the car and the orientation and the uh, steering angle of, of the front wheels, assuming you have a front wheel steered car. Um, but an easier solution is to actually just plan the center of the steering axle. And so you go from a four-dimensional system down to a two-dimensional system, and you optimize that, and you, you can analytically recover the rest of the um, uh, 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 variables, uh, like I say, for free. And so uh, what the, the idea is, is that if you have a differentially flat system, like a quadrotor or an Ackerman steered car or a fixed wing vehicle, then you can actually simulate the entire motion of the vehicle using a small number of uh, dimensions, and you get a much uh, simpler <coughs> steer function uh, as a result. Um, so you could uh, uh, use the RRT star uh, to actually plan in that state space. So, you know, quad rotor, four uh, degrees of freedom, fixed wing again, four degrees of freedom. Um, you still left a little bit of a problem with the steer function in that actually, even in this differentially flat space, it's a little complicated to actually join up the states from uh, uh, step to step. So, in order to get this to work, uh, 
a, a useful thing to do is to take the ROT star with a simple approximated dynamics in terms of straight line uh, motion from point to point. And then we can actually take the, the differentially flat version but of the full dynamics and do numerical optimization on that process. So you start with an RRT star and you solve for the simplified dynamics very, very efficiently and then you take the, the simplified dynamics plan and then you optimize it for the true dynamics of the vehicle and differential flatness makes this uh, extremely easy. And uh, the, you, what you can see here is that the solution time is much faster. We go from taking this problem, uh, which is 120 uh, seconds to solve, and uh, given just the initial formulation of the, the problem, doing the RRT star straight line, and then optimizing the plan, we can do that uh, very efficiently. So what's, what's the magic here? Um, I've sort of set up a problem, and I've set up a solution technique, and uh, I uh, said that we can solve it uh, very quickly. So, so how does this actually work? Um, so I'd like everybody to follow along very closely, because we're going to go through this line by line. I hope that's OK. Um, no, this is just a, a show of force. Uh, the, the, this, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, because the sad truth is that it's actually just a standard quadratic program. <laughs> you take the dynamics of the system, and you, formula, uh, you, you take the differential flat formulation, and uh, you write down the dynamic constraints uh, of, of how the vehicle works in terms of min curvature, max, uh, well, you know, uh, min curvature of the vehicle, velocity constraints, et cetera, and uh, you give it to your favorite QP solver, you know, uh, Cplex or Groby or whatever, and, and you just get out a nice answer very quickly. Um, it actually transpires that a, a, the, the conventional formulation of uh, uh, air vehicle dynamics um, tend to lead to a numerically unstable uh, optimization. And uh, we have an IJR paper that describes some tricks that you can use uh, in order to actually make it more stable. You turn a constrained quadratic program into an unconstrained quadratic program. And again, this is not particularly uh, sophisticated or interesting, and, and uh, you're welcome to go and read the paper uh, in order to see how to implement it yourself. Um, but so please, go ahead. Is that the quadratic program going from the three-dimensional three to the 12-dimensional real dynamics, or is it going no. So it's going from straight line linear uh, dynamics okay, from, RRT, okay. from RT star to the, the differentially flat, uh, it's actually four dimensional, four dimensional. Um, uh, quadrotor or fixed wing dynamics, optimizing that. And then the differential flatness gives you all the rest of the system analytically. Oh, it gives you that, okay. Yeah. Um, and so this video here is showing a quadrotor uh, flying in the lab space. And what's really nice is that we get very uh, smooth and uh, efficient trajectories. What we're actually doing is we're solving for the minimum snap trajectory. So it's not minimum time. It's not um, uh, minimum energy. It's the smoothest uh, trajectory. You can choose your own um, uh, trajectory uh, op optimization criterion. Uh, we like minimum snap because it tends to lead to a uh, less uh, fewer forces on on the vehicle and also leads to more aesthetically pleasing um, trajectories. And so we uh, the quad rotor is hitting <coughs> eight and eleven meters per second in this uh, environment, but we feel very good about uh, in the generality of this technique. Um, and uh, the quadrotor dynamics are maybe not necessarily the most exciting uh, 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 demonstration platform. Um, the really interesting one is the fixed wing aircraft. So this is a fixed wing aircraft flying in the parking garage under the Stata Center. And uh, the uh, trajectory here is specified by white points. Uh, so we wanted a figure eight trajectory. So we didn't, in this case, we didn't solve using the RT star. We just drew a straight line trajectory we wanted the vehicle to fly and then optimized it using exactly the same technique. And I, I like showing this video because it really, I like actually showing this video not to academic audiences, but to industrial audiences, because what it really does is it emphasizes the importance of autonomy for the growing revolution in drones. If we want drones to fly in complicated spaces like this, they've got to be way more autonomous than they are. Um, the reason this video illustrates that is that there's actually no place where a human pilot could stand to uh, fly this. Human pilots are very good at flying complicated, aggressive trajectories in, in cluttered environments, but they need full observability. Um, the, the trajectory is big enough and there's enough stuff in the way that no matter where a human pilot stands, they can't fly it. They lose observability of the vehicle and it's going to hit stuff. Um, we can argue about like FPV flying, but that's very, very hard. The real thing is that a, a sensor on board here controlling the vehicle is the way that you get reliable flight of this kind. It's the way that you get reliable flight in the urban environment if you're delivering packages. It's the way that you get reliable flight uh, you know, when there's people around. Dieter. Two quick questions. So one, 
it's I guess it's based on the Hokuyu. Yeah. But how so, do you, so how do you do, how do you do how do you get the elevation also of the vehicle? So truth in advertising, first of all, the very next sentence I was gonna say is sadly, this is a known map. So this does not emphasize the power of autonomy in unknown environments. And then how do we get the uh, uh, elevation out? Um, on this particular vehicle, I can't remember, there's two things you can do. One is you can put a little mirror in the plane of the field of view of the laser and just bend it out so you get like a little bit of extra information. I have a feeling by this video we actually had a single point LiDAR, light, LiDAR, but I don't remember specifically for this vehicle. Now, we don't do the mirror thing anymore. LiDAR lights are so easy to get and cheap and low, low power that that's really the, the, best, the best way to do it. And, and could you, like how far are you from being able to say there's a car suddenly parked somewhere in the middle of the street, like to react to that? Oh. Really good question. Uh, that, so if a car magically appeared, poof, in the middle of this, yeah, you could put it, you can make it appear at the right, right place at the right time, or maybe the wrong place at the wrong time, and the vehicle would not be able to react. So that actually sort of folds into some later material in the talk. So I, I'll, I'll come back to that question, but this is not thinking about, there's nothing in here that deals with dynamics of the environment. This is really just like, how do we actually get the, the aggressive flight? And it comes down to picking the right reduced order model of the system and then doing, up, doing approximate optimization. Um, and and the, like I said, the sad thing is, is that unfortunately we don't uh, have this, we did not have this working in, in unknown environments. So the question is, how do you now get this to work in unknown environments? Um, uh, for this next part of the talk, I uh, have to leave the air domain for a while. Uh, getting air vehicles to fly aggressively at like 11 or 12 meters per second in unknown environments is not something that works uh, extremely well yet, although I will show you videos. I'll return to the air vehicle domain uh, later on in the talk. We really wanted to get our arms around what it meant to drive or fly or move very quickly. Uh, Just pretty yeah. Yep. So do we know the dynamics of the system, the full dynamics of the system? Yeah. The previous one? I mean, we use an approximate uh, model, so we're doing flat plate assumptions for the wings in order to get like lift vectors, et cetera, but it's a fairly sophisticated is dynamics it model. Is possible to do like tra traditional trajectory optimization on the fly for like the next 10, 5 seconds? So you could do a receding horizon type thing, but solving, you know, that very simple problem that I showed you with the RRT star was 120 seconds. So, and that was a very, I wouldn't, I, like if you can't solve that problem in sub-second, I don't think receding horizon is going to work at all. So you, I don't think you can do traditional optimization. And what were the four parameters of the, of the differential flatness for, for the flying? Uh, I, I think so, so for the quad, it's the uh, center of body, X, Y, Z, okay. and then the heading direction. Okay, so X, Y, Z, and okay. And for the airplane, is the same? Uh, I have to double check that. I don't remember off the top of my head what the okay. fixed wing uh, differential flat model is. But it still must be velocity. Uh, I'm just wondering. <laughs> just wondering yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't want to, I mean, uh, yeah, I can speculate. I should, you just go look it up. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember off the top of yeah. my head. Um, okay. All right, so I'm going to leave the uh, flying domain and we're going to uh, work on mm -hmm. driving for a little bit. So how do you get an RC car to drive in the parking garage at 15 or 20 meters per second? Um, we're going to, uh, we're going to stick with the laser rangefinder as our primary sensor, um, but let's let's do the little uh, the following thought experiment. Imagine that your RC car is wakes up and it's again in the parking garage, and it's got a laser rangefinder, and uh, this is the instantaneous uh, scene that it observes. Uh, it, it's that's what it sees. This is what we see, and we can see to do the translation back and forth. Um, the green block is the goal that it knows it's got to try and reach. Uh, the white space is free space, and the uh, red stuff is the edges of obstacles, and the gray is uh, where it doesn't know because it's occluded. And uh, we have a uh, problem now, which is that the green goal is inside uh, unknown space. And we need to figure out what to do about that because you, it's not, you know, motion planners like to know about free space or obstacles, and, and we got to tell something about the unknown space. So standard assumption is if you're optimizing, doing trajectory optimization in a map and you have unknown stuff, you can be conservative and you can uh, just assume that all unknown parts of the uh, environment are unknown, or are obstacles. And uh, you know we fill in and now we can't get to the goal. That's unfortunate. Um, we could be, do the opposite assumption, be optimistic, and assume that all the unknown parts of the environment are free space, just keep the obstacles. And we get a path that looks like this, and the vehicle is very happy to try and follow it. 
the uh, this the the problem is is obvious is that you know essentially what the vehicle has decided is the bit of the car between the front and the back that it can't see must obviously not be there, and uh, it's free to drive uh, through there. Uh, when I give this talk before, I usually make a joke about the relative political parties in the U.S., about the, <laughs> which party would follow this, but I'm not even sure I know which goes which anymore. So I uh, assume I said something funny about politics at this point, and we'll move on. Um, you know, so if we, if we see what actually happens in the true map, then the vehicle is going to blithely go through the thing that we, we know to be a car. Um, but at the same time, the overly conservative assumption wouldn't be the right thing, because it's a pretty minor deformation of the... Um, uh, trajectory still gets us to the goal in the right way. It seems unreasonable to be driving all the way over here, uh, given what we know about the structure of the world. And uh, the key idea here that I'm going to push on is the fact that we do know something about the structure of the world. Uh, when you see the fronts and the back of a car, and now admittedly the laser can't necessarily see the, the recognize it's the front and the back of the car, but the, 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 the intuition I think holds, which is if you see the front and back end of a car, it's kind of silly to assume that there's nothing in the middle. And if you see a pole with a car behind it, it's kind of silly to assume that this pure obstacle, the pole extends all the way into the middle of the car. So even though we may not have seen this scene before, and we don't expect to be able to replicate you know, uh, any kind of prior knowledge of exactly this scene, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And there is structure from our previous experience that can tell us something about the unknown parts of the, of the world. So that's, that's where I'm going to go uh, with this uh, particular um, uh, idea. So let's, let's set the problem up formally. So I'm going to assume uh, that I have a set of trajectories that I want to choose the best one of. And I'm going to do this in the receding horizon planning context. So I'm going to evaluate the, exp the, the cost of each one of these trajectories. Um, I have some immediate uh, cost that's up to some horizon. That's this term, J, right here. And then I have some sort of global guidance that tells me that, I'm, that I want to choose ones that make all thing, other things being equal. I want to choose trajectories that get me closer to my goal in some sense. And this is a very standard formulation for uh, motion planning. Um, I want to choose uh, from a discrete uh, set of motion trajectories just as some way of actually pruning my choices. I'm not going to do continuous optimization. And that's something that I think roboticists are, are relatively comfortable doing. Um, now, if I have uncertainty in my environment because my map is partially known, then I can't solve this exactly. Uh, this uh, is the current, my knowledge of the current state of the world, which is presumably the partial map and my state, et cetera. And this is the action that I'm considering. If that, that, that state of the world is probabilistic, then really what I want to do is I want to take an expectation of the uh, cost. So which of these trajectories that might be going in and out of unknown parts of the map has the lowest expected cost? So, you know, there's a couple of different ways that I could actually evaluate that expectation. So the simplest one is actually the same ones that I've been talking about, which is I can just, you know, take the maximum likelihood thing. So that, that could be the conservative assumption. And I, uh, you know, just hope for the best. And I'm just going to go whipping around this corner and just assume uh, this is uh, free and, and into space. And that will give me some particular, that will give me a, 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 a particular top speed. Um, but it throws away all of the probabilistic uh, uh, sort of representation that's in my mapping system in terms of whether the space is really occupied or unoccupied or, or unknown. Um, we could solve the expectation exactly, um, but that unfortunately is equivalent to solving a POMDP, uh, where I'm really thinking about all the possible ways that the world could actually unfold itself and give them different likelihoods and different probabilities of, of maps. That is also not going to work. It's comp everybody who's worked with POMDPs knows that they're computationally demanding. And we can argue about how demanding they really are. But the real problem is, is that expectation is basically impossible to uh, calculate. When we construct probabilistic models of maps, um, the probability that, that is represented in the map is a really good way of balancing how much, we, we, how much information we have in the previous data versus the new piece of sensor data. But it's actually a really terrible way of representing an actual likelihood of any given world model. In a grid-based map, where we have probability of occupied or not occupied in discrete cells, um, there are very, very strong and broken independence assumptions. Uh, there are uh, really, um, and, and it's very, very high dimensional. Uh, so what I really don't have a good way of doing is even evaluating one expectation of an action given this map, because the distribution itself 
is just not representative of the structure of the world. You know, there is, the, the grid cells are not uh, independent. The probability that there's a chunk of car between the front and back end is correlated between the front and back and not uh, independent of those. So I can't do the uh, traditional optimization thing. But maybe what we can do is we can actually try and learn the expected cost of calculation given the current environment that the robot is in and given previous, expect, given previous experience of similar places that I might have been. So I'm in a long corridor with doors on either side. I have some expectation that I will see T-junctions, and I won't expect to see a, uh, a tree in the middle of the corridor. I'm in a forested environment. You know, the, the, the structure of the environment is going to be distributed, again, with structure, but in a very different way to the, the corridor environment. But I can use that previous experience to make predictions about the likelihood of collision uh, for various uh, trajectories as I move into the unknown parts of the space. So how am I going to do this? I'm actually, in order to evaluate that expected <laughs> cost function, really what I care about is the probability of collision. So I care about two things. One is am I making progress to the goal, which is in my heuristic function, so that's off into the future. And then there's the probability of are my, is any one of my trajectories in my trajectory library likely to collide with something given the partial uh, model I have of the environment? And I'm going to learn that. That's a really nice, well-defined probability distribution now. I'm going to learn that from data. So what, what is the data going to look like? Imagine that I take my, my little RC car, or eventually my uh, aircraft, and I drive it around in different environments. Maybe I drive it around in simulation. And at each point in time, I'm collecting sensor data, and I'm building a partial map, just as you see here. And at every point in time, I'm also considering possible trajectories I might take. Some of those trajectories might go into, you know, some, if I'm in a particular place where all the trajectories end in free space, very good. Um, but some of those trajectories I'm considering might actually end up in unknown space. And I label each of those places, states that I am in, plate locations and partial maps. And I label the trajectories that I'm considering. And I label them with whether or not they were going to be in collision or not. And I have access, because if I do this in simulation, or if I do this at training time, I have access to the ground truth map. So I might not actually, you know, the, the system might be building a partial map that looks like this. But presumably, for training purposes, I can get access to what the actual map looks like. And I can label some of these trajectories as going to be in collision. OK? So are these features features of the trajectories or of the environment? Uh, so they are features of the robot position and state. So velocity is important. They are features of the partial map. And they're features of the trajectory being considered. So it's all three things in one. Um, and so that, that question gets me sort of, you know, so people like to ask, what exactly are these features? So ones that we tend to use are just how fast is the vehicle going? How fast is the trajectory? Uh, how, where's the vehicle going to end up near, uh, relative to the nearest obstacle? Where's the vehicle going to end? How fast is the vehicle going to be going when it gets to the front, uh, frontier of the, uh, the map, sort of the boundary between known and unknown space? And, and this is a very uh, a, a simple set of features. Then. What we do with this data, these, these features that are extracted from the trajectory, the state, and the map, and the labels, is we just learn a probability function. And we can use a very, very simple learner in this particular case. Is we, just, we initially tried this just with logistic regression. So you see here um, uh, you know, a couple of feature values. I can't remember which features these are, but let's say this is speed and distance to the uh, frontier. Um, and so if you're going fast, and you're close to the frontier, you see high probability of collision. And down here, if you're going slowly and you're far from the boundary of free space and unknown space, you have low probability of collision. And uh, so really simple um, uh, pro uh, function to learn, re uh, a really simple uh, probability distribution. And we can plug that into our expected cost calculation and evaluate our trajectories. Just Really quickly, um, the other thing that we need is a heuristic, uh, the, 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 the global function that gets added to the expected cost to go that ensures you make progress to the goal. I'm not going to say anything fancy about this right now, um, but you could take your partial map and you could treat all of the unknown spaces, free space, and just run Dijkstra's algorithm, uh, breadth for shortest path, and, and just plug that in. It's going to be wrong, um, but what it will do is it will cause you to uh, drive towards parts of the map that are likely to, uh, that seem to make progress uh, towards the goal. Um, so let's not worry about that here at right now, but just for completeness, uh, we'll fill it in. And we tried this on the RC car, and this is from the K 
camera view and you'll see the robot driving around and it does the sort of the things that you might expect, which it sort of steers away from obstacles and it steers more towards the face <coughs> and, and, and it drives, but it does okay. It's a little twitchy. Um, and uh, I think at the end of this video, it actually ends up uh, steering into something and then having, having to stop itself. And so just the initial formulation you know, seemed nice and clean to us, uh, but uh, we, wasn't, we weren't getting the kind of performance that we really wanted out of this. And so the question was. Uh, and how was that trained? Simulation or? So uh, that one was trained in simulation. And in fact, for, a lot of the, for all the um, results that I'm going to present with using the laser rangefinder, it's trained in simulation. It turns out that it's actually really easy to simulate a laser rangefinder in realistic environments driving around. So um, less true when we, uh, when we have a camera. So when you can calculate the probability of collision, then uh, what is the planner that uses that? A collision function to so we so this so there's the cost the, the length of the trajectory which is uh, um, gives you some cost and then you take expectation of uh, collision along there and then if you have some high cost of collision you just yeah. do a simple expected cost calculation so, and that in here. But what planner do you use to find the best uh, trajectory? No, no, we have a library of trajectories. Mm -hmm. so we just evaluate each one. And how do you get that library? Uh, that is so that's a really good question. Um, for this work, we uh, for what I'm going to present here, we use uh, we just hand code them, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I will show a video towards the end where we actually are working with Russ Tedrake to come up with uh, optimized trajectory libraries. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to be uh, talking this work. Yeah, because I mean, I can understand getting one trajectory, but having many trajectories is like, that, that's what, <laughs> I mean, figuring out many trajectories is, is seems. Well, so I think maybe it's possible your intuition is that like, you know, is it realistic for me to assume that I have a small and compact set of trajectories that are going to care, allow me to do everything that I care about? Is that sort of your question? No, I guess I understand how, given a, a cost function, you yeah. can optimize the trajectory. I'm not optimizing the trajectory. I'm picking a trajectory. So the trajectory is fixed. <coughs> Does that okay. make sense? Uh, we can talk. Later. Okay, very good. Go ahead. Uh, so it's the, the only thing learned from simulation is the collision labels is tested. Yes. But the simulations give you much more information to it. For example, you could learn something like the cost of a function. Oh, hold that thought. So, so, so far, all I've done, but I will, yes, absolutely, great point, hold that thought. Um, I, I, you have to hold for a little while, sorry. Uh, because what I want to do is I want to talk about the learner. So let's just keep the same uh, learning problem and think about what's holding back our uh, performance. A very quick one, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when you just do the expectation, is that just you have a linear kind of relationship between collision, shouldn't it almost go up kind of exponentially where you say if the chance collision doubles, then my cost should go up nonlinear or something like that? Uh, no. Why? So ex expectation is a linear function, and I don't know why you would make it nonlinear. Sure, non but you might want to say you, you really want to avoid. Um, I guess you could. We don't. Uh, I, I'd, I'd need better motivation than simply being uncomfortable with linearity to address that. I, like, uh, that's it's pretty standard to, you know, like, linearity of expectation is something that it, you know it has many nice properties that I'd be loath to give up. Um, so, <coughs> everybody good? I can go on. Okay. Uh, so, so the the, the problem is is uh, the following with logistic regression and, and a lot of learners, which is that if I have data that is uh, you know if, if I have a query point um, that is represented represented well in my data, so I have in an office building and I have lots of data of what it's like to drive around fast in office buildings, then the learner does a reasonably good job. Um, but if I end up in a place where I have a query where I don't have much data, um, you know, I'm evaluating uh, the likelihood of collision basically using a, a kernel function over uh, a feet, the distance between features. Um, and the learn, logis, logistic regression has, does not care at all if you're far from your actual data. It will quite happily give you an answer to this question. An awful lot of learners have this problem where like, if you don't have a lot of support in your data, then uh, you, you will end up with, uh, it'll still happily give you an answer and you won't necessarily know. 
And, and this, this problem showed up where we w didn't have a lot of training data, and that was causing a lot of the difficulty with uh, the vehicle performance not being particularly good. But more generally, a question that came up a lot as we were doing this work is like, are you seriously saying that you're going to have enough training data that will capture all of the scenarios that you're going to encounter in the world? Like, are you not going to use this system until you've trained in I indoor environments, in, you know, trained in um, the, the Allen Building, which is nice rectilinear corridors, and the State, State of Building at, at MIT, which has no rectilinear corridors um, and outdoor environments of various kinds and the answer is no of course not uh, we're not going to do that so what we'd really like is a learner that doesn't extrapolate to novel environment types what we'd really like is a learner that uh, you know tells us when the pro output distribution is fundamentally uncertain itself and so uh, what we want is not just a prediction but a confidence of prediction uh, uh, supported by the data and so really what we're talking about is not just modeling output distributions over probabilities. We're modeling likelihoods of those probability distributions themselves. So sort of stated more formally, given the training data x and probability of collision y of x, can we output a distribution over p of y of x star given the new query x star? So this, so really what I want is a dis likelihood of these different output distributions. And this is not an amazingly difficult problem in uh, machine learning. Um, so Bayesian nonparametrics in particular give you output distributions over your output parameters. So I could imagine training a Gaussian process distribution over uh, the, the, the Bernoulli parameters of my uh, uh, collision probability distribution. Um, but the problem is that the GP has some defici deficiencies <coughs> in it. So the confidence of the GP is uh, strongly correlated with the um, amount of data, which is what we want. Um, but at the same time, we also want the variance of the data to be reflected in the output of the GP, and it doesn't do that. And, and the other thing is that we actually want well-formed probability distributions out. And the GP isn't, is going to give you a Gaussian, but if your output distribution isn't Gaussian, then the GP is really going to struggle with this. And there's lots of ways to vary the Gaussian process model. So you can look at the, uh, if you have covariance, you want to do outputs over covariances, then, then the thing called the inverse Wishart process will do this. Um, but they're all computationally really demanding. There's sparsification techniques, but it's an awful lot of machinery. For what, at the end of the day, we want is a really simple idea. What we realized we really wanted is we wanted to interpolate between our training data where the confidence in the interpolation was a function of how much data we actually had. So imagine that I'm going to output a distribution over my, multi my Bernoulli probability distribution that's a function of uh, interpolating uh, the, the training data distributions themselves. And then I'm actually going to make the, the, the output distribution uh, sort of be, be smooth in the sense that if I have a bunch, if I'm close to a, uh, a bunch of, if my input is uh, close to a bunch of training data, then I want my output probability distribution to be close to those uh, training data distributions. And then within the, the, that sort of distance function, I want to enforce some sort of, I want the least certain distribution that obeys that smoothness uh, constraint. And so this is, this is basic um, uh, Sort of, uh, interpol uh, probabilistic interpolation. So there's nothing particularly sophisticated about this, except that we had a problem in using this, which is, uh, let me, uh, so essentially what I'm doing is I'm trying to uh, find the maximum entropy distribution that it, uh, it obeys the smoothness constraint in terms of my, my query label and all my training data. Um, and so, so we can formulate this as an interpolation amongst the, the training data distribution. But the problem is the following, at training time, what I had were example scenarios, so uh, maps and ac uh, actions and robot states, and I had labels in terms of collision. Now, I could have got true training probabilities of collision by putting the vehicle in that state over and over and over again and finding different environments with the same features and actually you know, replicating and getting a true distribution. That's really, really hard. And so what I real we realized is this kind of uh, probabilistic interpolation and this, uh, uh, what is essentially a kernel regression scheme, uh, required us to have training data in distributional form in order to output a distribution. And we didn't have that. We had samples drawn from the underlying distribution. But uh, the grad student working on this, uh, Will Vega Brown, uh, noticed a clever thing, which is that if we choose an exponential family, any exponential family distribution, Gaussian, Bernoulli, multinomial, Poisson, et cetera, et cetera, and we rewrite it in its natural form, 
uh, then the posterior distribution over the, the probabilistic parameters can be written as a function of how close you are to the training data and a, fun a sum over the data drawn from the underlying distributions themselves. And that's the, the sum might over be only one example of a, a label, collision or not collision, given the uh, query point. So now, all of a sudden, we have a way to take samples, uh, query samples, positions of the world, trajectories, etc., and whether or not it collided, and infer what the corresponding distribution might be, and tell you what the likelihood of the probability distribution is for some new query point x star. And so I'm not going to, uh, so this is a NIPS paper that we wrote a couple of years ago that, that's been super useful for us because it's very, very efficient. You know, uh, we can take a ground truth distribution that is not Gaussian and we can apply a GP to it. And it's, that's an approximation because the GP is not doing the right thing. It's, it's smoother, but it's, it's uh, also quite inefficient. Using our uh, kernel estimation, it's essentially a near uh, interpolation scheme, we get, you know, not substantially worse approximation than GP and we get it a, a lot more efficiently. And uh, when I say a lot more efficiently, the, I, I've talked about the covariance estimation previously. We can do um, um, uh, uh, queries in you know, a couple of orders of magnitude faster time than, than using a Gaussian process to do this. So this, this uh, particular uh, kernel regression scheme works really, really well for us. And it gave us exactly what we wanted, is the ability to predict well-formed probability distributions and also to get a, set, a, a probability or likelihood of that probability distribution. So we could distinguish when our classifier was uncertain because it, it was an uncertain scenario or if it was uncertain because the underlying data just wasn't there. And so we uh, take our uh, um, logistic regression scheme from before and we plug in our generalized kernel estimation scheme. And what we uh, saw all of a sudden is that we could um, you know, re uh, compute the likelihood of a prediction scheme over here. And then given that likelihood of a probability of collision, we can combine it with a prior distribution. So when the prediction is fundamentally uncertain, you rely much more heavily on your prior for predicting the likelihood of collision. And when you have enough data to actually inform the likelihood that that distribution, then it washes out the prior. And so as you get more and more data in new and more and more scenes, your learner is initially using presumably a conservative prior, if that's what you want. And then as the data piles up, you get uh, better and better performance. And so this graph basically illustrates uh, this, is that um, as a vehicle is driving around and we see uh, prediction probabilities with 20 data points, um, the confidence with which making those predictions indicates you know, that we got a pretty widespread of probability of collision. But then as we uh, have a lot more data, so this goes from 20 to 2,000, when um, we have uh, lots of data, we see that um, the, the confidence gets uh, much, much higher. And it's exactly what you'd expect, is that when we're very close to obstacles, we have a high probability of collision. When we're uh, not too far away from obstacles, we have a low probability of collision because we can avoid them. And then once obstacles are reasonably far away, it's actually really hard to tell whether or not you're going to have a collision. And so that gets reflected in the prediction um, and, and in the fact that we don't necessarily have uh, a lot of data. But the really interesting uh, graph uh, is here, which is that, um, so three scenarios, dark blue, train in one environment, test in the same environment. Uh, uh, red is train in one environment, test in another environment, but use the same logistic regressor. And then light blue is train in one environment, test in a different environment, use the uh, generalized kernel estimator to make predictions, and include a prior. Okay? X axis is pro uh, cost of collision. So when cost of collision is low, we're free to go fast. This is normalized velocity up here, and this is how often we crashed down here. So uh, cost of collision is really low, crash all the time, because who cares? Um, Cost of collision is high, you presumably don't want to crash at all. What we see is that when we test and, test and train in the same environment, dark blue, uh, when cost of collision is low, we're free to go fast, and we continue to go fast because we learn the right thing to do, um, and we don't uh, crash very often. But this is test and train in the same environment. Red is test and train in a different environment, but don't take advantage of the model that I just described. And we have no idea what we're doing. So when the cost of collision is high, we still go really fast. And of course, we collide a lot. Because you know, the computer is like, I don't know. It seems fine to me. Um, and then uh, the light blue is what we see is that when we enter the new environment, when cost of collision is high, we go fast uh, and we collide a lot. When the uh, cost of collision is high, we know we don't know what to do. And so we gear down a lot. We go quite slow. But we, give, we have our uh, collisions um, taken care of. And so this is essentially the robot has learned how to drive fast when it can go fast. And it's learned or used the data to say, you know what, I don't know what's going on here. I'm going to go slow. So it's empirically very, very safe. And uh, 
what we see here is a video of the robot driving around, um, not doing trajectory optimization, but it's just picking which motion primitive to use. When it enters this chicane, it slows down, as you might expect. Um, when it em enters the uh, open space coming up ahead, it, it, go, it feels free to go quickly. And then just, at the, just in this next part, um, I like this next part of the video because it reminds me of the hairpin turn under the Casino Monte Carlo, for those of you who follow Formula One racing, is the vehicle slows, uh, this hairpin turn right here, the vehicle slows right down, uh, just as the Formula One racers slow down in the same place. And then it <laughs> takes off and, and goes again. Again, it's all learned from data. It's seen these kinds of scenarios before and it knows when it can go fast and what kinds of uh, mo uh, lines to follow as it goes into the curve in order to go as, as quickly as possible. So, very pleased uh, by this. Um, so it seems like you're, you're computing these features and yes. that's what you're using for the logistic regression. Yes. Um, do you have any idea, like it seems if you're using a, like an RGB image, yes. that there would also be some uncertainty if you had a feature extractor which says, is, are these even the right features to have extracted from this image? Yeah. And then there'd be uncertainty. It might look like this observation is close to something you've seen before and you might like overestimate your confidence. Do you have any idea how you might deal with that? So, uh, complex <coughs> question. The shorter, shortest answer I can give you is um, deep learning. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but the longer answer is, yeah, you would absolutely like to fold in you know, more understanding of the scene. And I don't have much to say about that because we're just getting into the uh, camera-based case. Um, but uh, uh, you, know, yet you, you would absolutely like to have the system understand more of the scene in order to understand w w how well its feature tracks were, were behaving, et cetera. Um, yeah, I don't really have a better answer than that, sorry. Um, now, notice I said that this was empirically very safe. Um, empirical safety, from an aero perspective, is fairly unsatisfying. You know, it's very hard to go to a regulator and say, you know, I tried it a bunch of times and it seems to work. Um, <laughs> so, and, and in particular, what we, we see here is, you know, there are transients where the cost of collision is sort of right on the edge. Sometimes we crash, sometimes we're not, because that's exactly what the expected cost calculation says we should do. And I think this might get to your point, Dieter, which is that, like, you know, how, how do you really want to be safe? And, and at the end of the day, what you can't do is you can't guess about what's around the corner and assume that it behaves the same way as it did uh, the last 15 times you, you saw it. What, what actual provable or certifiable safety is really about then is, okay, we want to go fast. And we're unwilling to drive, you know, be optimistic about what's happening in the unknown parts of the space. So actually what we need to do is we need to make sure that we know as much as possible about the environment. So there's, there's as few cases as possible where we're going slowly because we can't see very well. So the problem now changes from, you know, being able to predict what's happening in the unknown parts of the space from the point of collision to actually being able to predict what's happening in the unknown parts of space from the perspective of visibility. So that what I really want to do is I want to, um, uh, so what I really want to do is I want to avoid scenarios where like I hug the wall, corner of the wall and limit my visibility and force me to go slow. What I want to do is I want to guess that this is probably a right hand turn and so I should probably swing wide as I go around that turn in order to expose more of this and stop me from having to slow down. And this gets back to the question, this gets to the question at the back which is, you know, this heuristic function, where did it come from? So what we're going to do is we're going to leave the, um, uh, the immediate cost uh, evaluation as it is and uh, uh, put guaranteed safety on that. We're going to push this visibility into the, into the heuristic. Um, so what we, um, I've already said all this, I'll skip over this slide. So let's go back to our receding horizon planning problem. And we had this ex expected cost over the immediate action. So we can't do that anymore. We can't take expected costs. We need to know. So we're going to get rid of that. And we're not going to pick any trajectories that violate our safety constraints. So every action that we take had better, this, this G is you know, um, collision or not, that G had better be zero everywhere. And so that leaves us with one place where we can put this kind of information, which is in the heuristic. And we're going to de devise a heuristic that lets the robot see better. Um, and, and specifically what I'm going to do is I'm going to, there's some heuristic that I uh, don't know. And there's some heuristic that I was using before, which is the shortest path to go. And what I'm going to try and do is learn the difference between these two. Um, and so then what happens is if I uh, take my original immediate cost function, I add in the heuristic I was using, and I add in this difference term that's basically learning how much better it is if I can actually see as I go around the corner, then, then I do well. 
Um, so the training procedure is, is essentially the same, so I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but basically the output labels are now this, the difference between the, the true heuristic and the immediate shortest uh, path that I, I was using. And I do the same pr uh, training procedure. I drive the robot around and I just collect data, but I look to see how much more information I got about the world and how much faster I could actually uh, go if I took different trajectories um, uh, subject to the safety constraint. And uh, the learning procedure, you know, does something that you reasonably might expect is that it tends to say that there's, a, you know, a, a, a lot of improvement, or so a lot of improvement if we are far from the frontier and we can see a lot of it, and there's not much improvement if we're really close to the frontier and we I don't see much of it. These are bad places to go, so high, high cost. So we're really going to try and look for trajectories that keep us away from uh, the, the obstacles, but at the same time give us a lot of visibility into uh, the environment. And uh, what we, the, the, what's nice is now we actually start to get into a planning strategy that actually learns what it means to actually have a narrow field of view. So cameras, the laser rangefinder was great because it had a 270 degree uh, field of view. But if we actually make it behave more like a camera where there's a narrow cone of, of free space we can see in front of us, then we see that at 60 degrees, um, if you don't use this prediction of how much better you can see, we actually never got to the goal in 10 out of 10 trials. Did we collide? No. So how is it that we failed? We drove ourselves into a situation that we couldn't easily drive ourselves out of. We got stuck in a corner. Uh, on the other hand, the learner learned that by taking wide swings around corners and other, doing other intelligent things, we got to the goal eight out of 10 times. And then if we give ourselves a little bit of a better uh, uh, cone of visibility, then the baseline now gets to the uh, uh, goal more times, four out of 10. We get there all the time and we're faster. Even though it might be counterintuitive in some cases to actually take a wider line around the corner, which is going to cost you in terms of uh, uh, execution time, we get more reliability and we get overall better performance on the actual task. And, and this uh, video here gives you a sense of uh, what this looks like. So this is the baseline planner. Notice it's hugging corners as it goes around them and this is ex exactly what you don't want to do. Um, and then I think in this point in the video, uh, it hugged that left-hand wall too closely, so it didn't have any idea what was going to be around the corner. And then the only thing it could do was actually just go on past the, the, um, uh, that junction and steer itself into the corner right there. Uh, in contrast, uh, our planner takes uh, better lines through this trajectory. It's, it's avoiding uh, being on the wrong side of the corner. You can see it swung right there just as before it was going to the uh, intersection on the left. It's going to do the same thing here. It swings right again before going uh, down the corridor and uh, unsurprisingly uh, gets, gets to the goal, which is very satisfactory. So the same machinery of using previous experience. First, if you really want to go fast, then you know, make predictions about what's going to happen in the unknown part of the environment. Or if you want to be safe, but you still want to be fast, then make predictions about how much more information you're going to get about the environment as you go. Um, so what's next? We're using these hand-coded features. And, and that's uh, unsatisfying. And, so, and it's really not going to generalize to the camera case. So we do, in fact, have a, a convolutional neural network that we're uh, working with um, different architectures to try and learn how to drive fast, again, in the, in the parking uh, garage environment. And uh, the graph on the bottom is basically just showing uh, probability of collision for different steering angles. So this is how I'm representing the trajectory library as a, as a set of discrete um, uh, uh, steering angles. The trajectory library has more properties to it than that, which I, I can't easily draw on the screen. But what you see is that as the vehicle sort of has a pole in the middle, the probability of collision is highest here. And then as, if there's structure to the left, you'll see the probability of collision go up here. Again, pole right in the middle, probability of collision. So we're starting to take advantage of, you know, 2016. Hyperparametric function approximation seems to be the thing to use. Um, <laughs> and, and we're starting to generate some of the, the same results. Um, but I, I said that uh, we wanted to put this on the air vehicle. I don't have everything working on the air vehicle, but I just want to very quickly wrap up with uh, some of our latest results of uh, flying in unknown environments in the air vehicle. So I'm part of a DARPA, F, uh, fast, DARPA program called Fast Lightweight Autonomy. And the objective is to get a, a DJI F450 F quadrotor to fly at 20 meters per second through an environment that looks like this. GPS denied, no prior map. Um, can the vehicle get to a goal, image uh, something, and then, and then re uh, return home uh, successfully over distances of a couple of kilometers? And uh, uh, just this week, we were uh, at an uh, airfield in Florida, and uh, we were doing trials in various places around uh, the airbase. And one particular trial uh, took place uh, here. So the idea is that the vehicle starts off here, and then has to fly, it, it has to find a barrel 
that is known to be located somewhere under here. And in order to actually, it's got an altitude ceiling, so the vehicle has to stay relatively close to the ground. And so it can't fly over the trees to this point and back again, and it has to do so without GPS. And so the vehicle takes off, flies down the road, has to turn right here, enter, there's actually a gate here, because uh, this is a pasture of some sort. It has to f get itself over to the tree. There's a barrels behind the tree. It has to take a picture of it and then return back to the, the start location. Um, uh, we're doing all of this with a single Flea 3 camera and an IMU for state estimation uh, for uh, observing the obstacles and not hitting them. We're currently, unfortunately, using a Hakuya laser rangefinder, which we're hoping to be done with in the next couple of months. But uh, this is where we are. Um, so this is a, a part of the video. The video, entire video is four, meter, four minutes long, so I'm just going to show a snippet of it. But this is the vehicle using the camera to you know, uh, control its uh, uh, position and velocity as it flies tr uh, towards that point in space. You're going to see it uh, attempt to the nose of the barrels behind these trees. It sees the trees um, and makes its way around here. Uh, this is DARPA instrumentation. And then you'll see the barrel in uh, the field. Oh, this, this particular video is one where the barrel wasn't actually behind the tree. The barrel was, was pulled further out. Um, but we're feeling good about a lot of these, transitioning a lot of the techniques I talked about in terms of path prediction and state estimation uh, to this particular vehicle. Now the vehicle saw the barrel. It's attempting to return home. Uh, we had a little bit of drift in state estimation, and so it failed to notice the exit on the right. And so now the vehicle goes for a bit of a walkabout uh, in the forest. But again, you know, the uh, state estimation held up very well here. Uh, it uh, realized it didn't want to go through that bit of the field and uh, found a clear path to the goal or the home position here. So, so at this point, we're actually going four meters per second. So we're going eight miles an hour, uh, which is actually uh, relatively quick. And we're able to navigate through these, these dense environments. And as we um, put more of the path prediction uh, technology into the quadrotor, uh, we're expecting to be able to go um, up to speeds of 20 meters per second, which you've already shown that we can do over a kilometer distance uh, without GPS um, when, there, when there are no obstacles. So we're making progress on this problem. Um, just really quickly, the last thing I want to say is all of this is, of course, just about basic navigation, getting from point A to point B. And what I'm really most excited about now is actually more higher level autonomy. Can this quad order do more things than just navigate to a location, but can it actually understand the scene? Can it uh, you know, um, uh, do long duration missions, tracking objects, imaging uh, infrastructure, delivering packages? Um, this, you know, the representations I'm using in terms of low level maps and uh, you know, uh, low level trajectories aren't going to scale to those kinds of problems. So I do think a new theory of representation is required for a higher level task and motion planning that can really represent uh, the more complicated parts of the mission. So uh, I, I'm, of course, just uh, the front man from the people who do the real work. So I have an amazing group of students and postdocs who've done all, all the work. I, I tell them that I'm just uh, PR and fundraising for, for their work. Um, but uh, you know, the, the, the papers that they've done represent, I think, you know, some real progress on, on some hard problems in fast and aggressive flight uh, for these vehicles. Uh, so thanks very much for your question so far. I'll stop here and take any more you might have. Questions? Uh, you're using simulations to essentially learn the cost to go function or the collision labels anyway. Yes. And why not just use the simulations, burn a lot of computational cycles, and just solve the problem? Uh, because that's so very good. <laughs> and I think that uh, that is doable for a little while. But it's a little bit like building a ladder to the moon, right? It'll work really well for the laser, and uh, you know you'll, you'll burn a lot of computation cycles. It'll work really well for short horizons, but it's not going to work well for predicting what's happening in the unknown parts of the environment. We don't have good uh, generational uh, generative models that allow us to you know simulate what might be happening in the unknown parts of the map. Um, and then as we get to more complicated scenarios, we get to more complicated sensors, and we get to um, a longer duration sets of things. At some point, you're just, your computer's going to fall over. You know, no matter how good your GPU is, I assure you I can kill it. Uh, so I think that you know, predicting from previous data you know, solves a lot of the problems with that approach. Please. Uh, so uh, you have stationary obstacles, really. Can you like extend your methods in order to scale in all moving obstacles? So we've been asked that question enough times that I think we actually have to go do it. Um, there's nothing that I've said that would prevent uh, the um, dynamic environments, prevent us from handling dynamic environments. What we need is data. 
and and presumably a way to get at the features. Uh, but you're right, we haven't done that, um, and, and very clearly we should. We're actually being kicked out. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank All you. Right.